welcome uh, everyone to Driving and Memory Loss. This is a community dementia education program of Alzheimer's San Diego. Uh, my name is Amy Abrams. I am the Director of Education at, at Alzheimer's San Diego. I'll be one of your presenters here this morning. And I am Jean Alton, a Dementia Care Consultant working at Alzheimer's San Diego with Amy and also in our Family Services team. Okay, our agenda for today, folks, is we are going to start by talking about how dementia is affecting driver safety. And then we'll look to what are some of the telltale signs of some unsafe driving and, and how to intervene, how and when to intervene. We will talk about collaborating with uh, the resources that we have at hand, which includes physicians and the Department of Motor Vehicles, as well as other family and friends. And then we'll have a look at uh, the local resources that we have here in San Diego County for driver safety evaluation and alternatives. You know, it's, you have to set up a plan in terms of uh, either asking a family member or insisting that a family member give up the keys and or for ourselves too. This is something we all have to think about. And it's not just as simple as handing over the keys. We need to, we need to develop a plan and have some good uh, options in place too. So when we take keys away, we need to offer good alternatives for people. Look at that, I can't advance my slides. Hmm. Can you help me out with that, Amy? We'll see if I got it. Yep, got it. I think so. There. So we'll start with how does uh, dementia affect driver safety? Oops. So we're going to just start with a little bit of foundational knowledge here. Um, so what is dementia and what we hope you all understand at this point in time is that um, dementia is neither a specific disease or a specific diagnosis. It is uh, describing a group of symptoms that is caused by something that is going on medically and it is affecting cognitive function. It's affecting thinking, processing, memory, all those different areas. It can cause behavior changes and it is interfering with uh, just the, the normal daily uh, routines and activities of life. So um, it's dementia is the word we use to describe these symptoms. There are many different types of disorders and conditions and diseases that can result in dementia. And just for your knowledge, uh, Alzheimer's disease actually is the most common type of dementia. If you I'm just gonna go back there for a moment and just say if you have further questions about dementia versus Alzheimer's disease, please give our social workers a call at our office and we've got lots of good information that we can give to you and talk to you about to help kind of round out your knowledge. So how does dementia affect a driver? Well, lots of different ways. We'll start with the top of the list and, and the one that is predominant in most types of dementia, which is memory loss. And so I want you to just think for a minute about how memory loss may affect a driver and their driving. And I'll just give you some ideas. Um, memory loss can result in potentially forgetting which pedal does what. Um, left or right, memory loss might result in failure to turn on the headlights in inclement weather. It might mean, you just think about all the controls around our steering wheels, and if the rain starts and we need wipers on as well as headlights, what do we start hitting all these different levers and, and buttons and such? And even forgetting which ones do what. Maybe I flipped on my turn signal when I meant to get my wipers on. Those are kind of the lesser ends of, of memory loss, but it can become more serious. Maybe I forget to put on my seatbelt, and even a small fender bender could be disastrous in that end. With orientation, we're going to kind of combine that with memory loss, and 
and the combination of the two can result in me or anyone else with dementia getting lost in their own neighborhoods, not knowing how to get home, not knowing how to get off of the freeway because we don't know where we are. We don't know where the right exits are, the right turns are. With regards to judgment, this is a very important one with driving because judgment is uh, a large part of the processing that we are using cognitively as we are driving. And it's a continual uh, use of judgment, assessing the traffic conditions around us, judging braking distance, how far you know, ahead of a stop sign do I need to start braking, uh, assessing rate of speed of vehicles around us and responding accordingly to that. That's all a part of the judgment that we're using. And if that's impaired, that's putting us and others around us at great risk. Behavior can impact driving. Um, this can be true with dementia or not dementia. It depends on if it's your baseline or not. Some people are angry drivers. Um, and that's, that's how they behave and have done through the course of their, their driving careers, as it were. But for others, uh, we may see a change in behavior where the person who was previously a very, you know, polite and, and good driver now is raising their fists angrily and blaming others for any of the challenges or problems or fender benders that are occurring. So that can be an issue as well, too. There are lots of sensory changes that go on with dementia. And so this is affecting, again, a person's ability to uh, identify and assess and make sense of uh, the sensory information that is coming in. So if I'm having trouble identifying a source of a siren, and there are some different siren noises. We kind of know the ones that are the emergency sirens, but there, there can be some different ones. You know, when they do the kind of high pitched, um, quick little blares, that means they're right kind of right there behind you and you need to get the heck out of the way. Well, if I don't know to distinguish that noise from uh, a long blaring siren, you know, from a emergency vehicle that's a little further away, I might not understand that that uh, fire truck or that that ambulance is right behind me. The other thing that we need to be doing with sirens, of course, is identifying what direction they're coming from. And if sensory information is being garbled up because of the dementia, I may not be able to do that. And there's other areas, of course, too. Vision-wise, we see a narrowing of the visual field in people with dementia. And so kind of all that um, the vision visual field becomes narrower. And so all this information over here, it doesn't mean that the eyes can't see that information, it's that the brain is not processing that information. Now I think we all know how important all this information is when we're driving, right? In addition to shoulder checking though, you know, we are using information from where we start to see a vehicle coming up alongside of us, maybe very quickly. And so when that is, is being reduced, it's really reducing some important information that we need in order to make good and safe judgments as we're driving. Here we go. So driving in dementia is a key public health issue. And I, we're going to just give you a little bit of statistics that's going to underscore that. And so drivers that are older, over the age of 75, do have an increased risk of collision for every mile that they drive. So the more miles they drive, you know, the, the higher the risk of a collision. The rate of fatalities for older drivers increases a little bit after age 65, but quite significantly after age 75. And then we couple that, those statistics with the fact that age is the primary risk factor for developing dementia. Uh, one in people over the age of 65, one in nine people, excuse me, over the age of 65 uh, will develop some type of dementia. And by age 85, that's about one in, th one in three. 
and actually kind of inching a little bit closer to two. So when we take that all together, we see that, um, you know, there, the risk is increasing for all of us as we are becoming older drivers in terms of driver safety, uh, rate of fatalities, and developing dementia, put all those things together. So as I was preparing for this class yesterday, I was just think, you know, thinking generally about driving, and I was thinking a lot about my uncle. He um, started driving at a very young age, probably 10 or 12. He was born in 1928, so I mean, that's what kids did back then, was they started driving early. And he drove, you know, not only vehicles, but heavy equipment. He um, was a fisherman, so he had a boat, so he was a good pilot. So he had lots of good experience in different motor vehicle situations. And I was remembering this morning, actually, that he and my aunt, uh, for many years, used to drive from Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada, all the way down to the tip of uh, Baja, California, to Cabo San Lucas. And that's a pretty good haul, right? So he was a really skilled driver. And then he got into his 80s, and boy, oh boy, we saw a change. I don't know why it's hopping around here. Honestly, I'm not doing that. <laughs> so what are the signs of unsafe driving? So this, these are some things we saw in my uncle. He didn't have decreased confidence at the start, but that started to come. And, you know, I think, I, I just think about other older people in my life, and I'm even thinking about my own driving. And I'm seeing a little bit of a change in my confidence level too. I don't know if you folks are seeing that in yourselves or the people you care about. But I think when we start to see a little bit more, less confidence and a little bit more hesitancy, that's the start of this. And yes, it can start. You know, I'm, I, I just turned 57. And I'll tell you when I have decreased confidence is nighttime driving. So we need to think about these things as we're growing older and then also be watching this in the people around us and our folks with dementia, if we're starting to see that hesitancy and that decreased confidence. We do see um, poor lane control in older, older people and some of this has to do with that visual field narrowing. Um, but, you know, I mean, to be honest, we see poor lane control in lots of other people too. But, you know, kind of that weaving from either side to side in the lane or maybe even going, you know, across the lines into other people's lanes. And, and that's, a, that's a concern and that's a worry. And that's a part of um, having trouble with that attentiveness to staying kind of right in the middle of your lane. That's the dementia affecting that. We may see people uh, going at inappropriate speeds. And contrary to what you may think, usually um, this means driving slower than uh, is posted and is safe. And I think we've all kind of encountered those situations in the freeways where we've got the person that's not in the slow lane is maybe in some of the middle lanes and is plugging along at 40 miles an hour, you know, which is is inappropriate speed it's also unsafe because they're not keeping up with the traffic um, but that is the tendency that we see for folks who are uh, experiencing some sensory losses and, and dementia that is starting to impact their ability to drive safely trouble navigating turns and <clears throat> what happens here is interestingly is that um, people start to take corners too sharply. So then the wheels, especially the real, rear wheels, are, um, you know, jumping up over the curb. And so uh, that's the kind of thing that we're seeing happening with our folks with dementia. You know, clearly that has repercussions, you know, especially at pedestrian corners where there might be a pedestrian standing there on the corner. Uh, if you clip the corner too quickly, you could potentially be hitting a pedestrian. Uh, becoming easily angered, confused, or distracted, um, all of those things, the behavior changes we talked about a little bit earlier, is also then, of course, impacting uh, decision-making and judgment for somebody 
with dementia and who is still driving. They are making poor decisions. Again, we're going to go back to poor decisions about the speed they're going at, their braking distance, when to stop, when to go. And I think about my uncle with this one because that's one of the things that we saw with him that was fairly significant is he would stop at a stop sign to say to turn right and he would look to the left and see traffic coming but he would make a decision to go when he should have waited. He was having trouble um, using good judgment with regards to the speed of the oncoming traffic as well as the distance. So then he'd scoot out, turn right, and really hit the gas. And I mean, my husband and I were with him a couple of times where it's like, oh my gosh, we just dodged an dodged a, a accident there. And that's, that was the thing that told us that he was having trouble. He was making some poor decisions. And then there's slow response times. You know, sometimes uh, we, we, oftentimes while driving, we have to make decisions and respond very quickly. Um, there's no time, there's no hesitancy allowed. And again, this is where we start to see that this is that lack of confidence and that uncertainty. Do I go or do I wait? What do I do? And we see people making errors at intersections, everything from not knowing who should go first at a four-way stop sign to um, potentially not paying attention to the lights. Do you have a turn light or do you not? And if you don't have a turn light, what is the, the protocol? What is the procedure? So, some other signs of unsafe driving. Parking inappropriately. And, you know, again, there's some people that park inappropriately all their lives. Um, so what we're looking for is something that's different from baseline. And I'm talking about everything from taking two stalls, you know, parking right kind of in the middle on the line, and or instead of coming into the, the parking spot kind of straight on, parking at a real angle so that basically people on both sides really actually can't use those spots. We're looking for new dings or scratches. And again, this reminds me a lot of my uncle because his, his trucks started to get pretty beat up with, you know, they were fender benders, but there was a fair accumulation of dings and scratches. So we knew that what was going on was next on the list was the near misses or the close calls. And of course he didn't, tell my aunt or other family members about a majority of those. If we have other drivers frequently honking their horns, that's usually for a reason. It's telling us something. Here in California, I, we really don't have, most drivers don't have a habit of honking for, you know, for no reason at all, just to, to um, declare their anger and frustration with traffic. Uh, that doesn't usually happen, although it does in other cities. So here in San Diego County, if you've got somebody honking at you, they're trying to tell you something, then you need to pay attention. And, you know, if you can't figure it out, it's a good idea to check in with any passengers you may have and say, what, you know, did I do something? What was that about? And, um, and pay attention to that, of course, with if you are a passenger, as we were with my uncle, um, as to what's going on. There's forgetting how to locate familiar places. That might be everything from driving past the grocery store, you know, missing the, the turn off or the exit for it, to, um, you know, again, just getting lost in your own familiar neighborhood, not being able to get to the places that you need to get to. And how do we know if that's happening, if they're out there on their own driving alone? Well, if they're returning from a routine drive later than usual, gone down to Vaughn's, it's actually, you know, just about eight blocks down the road, 10 blocks down the road. Uh, we're gonna pick up just a few groceries. Start to finish, it should really not take me much more than an hour, an hour, 15 minutes. And all of a sudden I'm gone for two hours, two and a half, three hours. Well, where, where was I? What was I doing? So it's a good idea to kind of look at those uh, long, uh, long time gone for a routine chore and a routine drive and, and try to piece together what has happened. And, you know, sometimes people are 
just again, driving past the Vons and forgetting where the turn is or thinking back, oh, I'm going to go to Ralph's and not remembering that Ralph's in this neighborhood closed. There's no Ralph's in this neighborhood anymore. So I keep driving and driving and driving because I'm looking for the Ralph's sign. So here's, this ties in with driving and driving and driving and looking for the Ralph's sign, wandering. People tend to think about wandering as a behavior that happens for folks that are on foot. But obviously, of course, it can happen to those who are driving as well, too. And first and foremost, un please understand that anybody with a diagnosis of dementia is at risk. And we know statistically that 60% or more of people with dementia will wander and become lost at some time. And this number is likely very underreported. Would you agree, Amy? Yes. Yeah. Anecdotally, we, we, we think there's a lot that just doesn't get reported. Yeah. And, you know, so it can happen by foot or by vehicle. It could happen on a bike. It can happen on a bus. A person uses the bus system. They can get lost on the bus or the trolley or whatever it might be. So um, I want to have a look at the bubbles over here on the left side. And I just want to address this. Um, you know, he's lived in this neighborhood for X amount of years. He knows his way home. Or I make sure she tells me where she's going. Or the classic one that I myself have heard gazillions of times is that, um, well, here he's never wandered before. Mm -hmm. So that's not a problem. Well, of course, it's not a problem until he wanders for the first time. And um, so it's, this is a area that it's really important for people to open their minds to the high probability that your person with dementia is going to wander and become lost at some point in time. So be proactive in these areas, please folks. What happens when you know folks are wandering or becoming lost? Well, it's, it's disorientation or confusion. Um, I'm gonna give you an example here shortly that kind of will illustrate a few of these different things. It's memories of past activities. Maybe somebody is, is kind of living a little bit in the past and thinking, well, it's time for me to go to work this morning, or it's time for me to pick up the kids from school, or you know, whatever it might be. It might be a physical need or discomfort. I'm feeling hungry. I think I'm gonna nip down to uh, Starbucks and get myself a coffee and a little sandwich. Off I go and I can't find Starbucks, and then I forget what I'm looking for, and I'm out there roaming around, goodness only knows where. And it might be agitation or restlessness. I'm bored, or I'm lonely, or I just, I want to get out of the house. I, and I think we're all feeling a certain amount of that right now, too. Mm -hmm. So I think when I was thinking about this slide yesterday, I was remembering, you know, I've worked with many families over the years, and unfortunately many wandering incidents, but I want to share with you the one that stays with me still after all this time was a family I worked with in the Oceanside area and a wife and a husband with dementia. And in the middle of the night, she was asleep. She did not wake up. He got up, he got dressed, he grabbed the car keys. And by the way, he hadn't been driving for some time already. But he grabbed the car keys and he went down and got in the car and left. Now she didn't know any of this. What happened is she woke up in the morning and he was gone and the car keys were gone. And so, you know, she ended up, of course, she called um, 911 and, and the police and her family and all these other people. And, and so they were all out looking for him. A long story short, it was a long couple of days for this, this lady and this gentleman and all of their family. He ended up, he drove all the way from Oceanside over the border into Tijuana. And luckily, well, the, the car broke down down there or got a flat tire or something. And some good Samaritans came upon him and saw he was confused. And so they picked him up and took him back to the border, to the border patrol. And so he was, you know, reunited, of course, with his family. 
And when they questioned him as to why he left, he thought he was going to work. That was his thought process at the time. And, um, you know, this was a tough 48 hours for these folks trying to figure out where he was. And it turned out, you know, he was across the border. These kind of things happen, folks. And they happen um, way more often than we want to. And oftentimes with, you know, some, some tragic consequences as well, too. So that's something to take very seriously with regards to dementia and wandering. So stop. Yeah, we need to stop and rethink and assess driving, uh, sometimes our own driving, uh, our people living with dementia, they're driving. And sometimes we actually need to get in outside professionals and resources to give us some objective opinions. We don't always see the whole scope of things that is going on. And we do try very hard to respect independence. None of us wants to have anyone telling us you have to stop driving and none of us i or few of us i think are of the mindset that we will hand over the keys at the first sign of any challenges we want to you know we want to keep our keys to ourselves right be independent so to that come on I, I give credit here, you know, this is Dave Barry. He's the uh, author and funny guy. And he says, the one thing that unites all human beings, regardless of age, gender, religion, economic status, or ethnic background, is that deep down inside, we all believe we are above average drivers. And is that not true? It totally is true. How many times have you been in, you know, a work situation or a family situation, you're telling a story about a bad driver and you're just shaking your head, just like, oh, that, that, that's just the worst. You know, I, I, I don't drive like that, no way. And I give credit also to Miss Amy Abrams for uh, finding that quote and putting it here in our driver and memory loss presentation, um, because I think it's just a good check. It's funny, but there's truth to it, and it's a good check for us. Part of why, part of what makes having these conversations so hard and with someone who has dementia or not, yeah, a huge obstacle. Yep, sure is. So we're going to move along here, and Amy's going to be talking about how we collaborate with some of those um, important and valued objective opinions that are out there for yes. us. Before we uh, before we do, I'm just going to pause and um, we're, we're going to be taking some questions later, but there is one here that was kind of related to one of the topics that Jean already covered. So I just want to address this one quickly. Um, we have a care partner who is curious, wondering, frustrated um, that her husband is not able to go north uh, when they're trying to get on a particular street. He always wants to only will turn south instead of going north, which is the direction they need to go. Um, so this happens regularly and causes conflict for them. Um, one of the, actually one of the signs of unsafe driving that we had to or shorten the list in the name of brevity, we couldn't really cover all of them, but um, one of the things that we do sometimes see happen to people with dementia who have that um, narrowing of the visual field that Jean was talking about is that people develop a very strong preference for their dominant side it can become very difficult for right-handed people to turn left and left-handed people to turn right. Um, so I don't know uh, this person's hand dominance, but that may be what's at play, um, or it may uh, just be sort of general uh, difficulty with the visual field, having more difficulty on one side and not feeling confident um, about making that Turn, whichever direction it is having to go um, south. So um, that could be uh, something that happens. Do know that we see, we see that frequently. We'll see people uh, develop a preference. They only want to make right turns. Um, and so uh, they'll have to circle a block. Yeah. 
So it's an, it's an interesting question and, and a frustrating situation for you um, as the passenger when you're going the wrong direction uh, that you need to be going, especially if it's going to take a long time to get yourself turned back around. Um, but patience, as always, is the name of the game. <laughs> yeah. So I think, and if I could just piggyback on that, you know, I think that's probably an early warning sign. Yes. So to be keeping eyes on other driving skills and, um, and yes, absolutely. That maybe then that's just how you, you go to the store is you right. go in this roundabout way because that's what he's comfortable doing is right hand turns. So plot it out and plan it out beforehand and then just go with it. Okay. I'm going to, um, do something kind of fun here. Uh, we'll see if it works. On your screen, you should see uh, a little a little quiz, a little little pop quiz for you. Um, your answers are anonymous. We won't know if you got it right or wrong. But tell me if you think this is true or false. In the state of California, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or another type of dementia will result in the automatic revocation of driving privileges. Just give you a few seconds to tell me whether or not you think that is true or false. Okay, All right, we've got the majority of you have voted and uh, the majority of you, let's see, have said um, that 87% of you believe that this is false, 13% of you um, believe that this is true. Thanks for uh, participating in that uh, with us. Uh, the answer is false, uh, the, that, is, that is a false statement, um, but it is a little bit tricky. So um, I will clarify that as we, as we go along here. Um, you can go ahead and close that um, box out on your screen if it hasn't already disappeared. Just click that close. But. Should, should have gone away. So thanks for, um, thanks for uh, participating in that. And now we're gonna talk about ways that you can collaborate with the doctor um, and the DMV. Okay. Okay, let's start with, um, oops. start with the doctor um, to, to get to that, uh, that tricky question. One of, the, um, one of the things that sort of trips us up when it comes to getting a dementia diagnosis, um, working with the doctor, figuring out the relationship between the doctor and DMV is what a lot of us have heard um, that it is a, uh, a mandate, here, at least here in California, but also in most states, that doctors do need to make a report to the DMV when somebody is diagnosed with Alzheimer's or some other type of dementia and they have to stop driving. That is not exactly how it works. Um, a person does not have to stop driving unless they are having problems driving. It's their individual ability to drive, their skill loss uh, deficit um, or ability that, um, that determines whether or not they're able to keep driving, not just the, the presence of a diagnosis. There is a mandated report in the state of California. Uh, the doctor makes a report to the, the department, the local department of public health, and then that then translates to, uh, translates, moves on to a report to the DMV. This is not the doctor revocating a person's driver's license. Only the DMV or law enforcement can actually take away, uh, revoke a person's driving privileges. Um, but the doctor can put any number of things in that report. They can just simply say that they've made a diagnosis and not provide a lot of detail. Um, uh, they can give, they can make the report that the diagnosis has been given, but say that they think this person is still safe to drive. Uh, they can also say this person has received a diagnosis and they should not be driving. So there's any number of things that the doctor can say. Ultimately, it's up to the DMV to make the decision about what's going to happen. So that report is not an automatic revocation of driving privileges, but the reality is it does often result in the revocation of driving privileges. So we'll talk more about what happens on the DMV side of things next. 
we just want you to be aware of uh, the that mandate here in California um, and to see, to come to see the doctor as a partner in all of this um, they they can give uh, usually if the doctor knows the patient pretty well and you may need to seek other opinions depending upon the the doctor's knowledge uh, firsthand knowledge of of the individual um, but the doctor can be a good source of objective uh, evaluation, whether or not they think, based on what they see in their very limited perspective in an office, um, do they think that this person um, should continue to retain driving privileges. The doctor can also be a good advocate and support to you if um, if a person might respond to something like uh, a physician's order, right? Getting a letter from the doctor on their letterhead or writing it on a prescription pad and sticking it on the refrigerator, right? Some kind of a reminder, a reinforcement that the doctor thinks maybe that um, I shouldn't be driving or you shouldn't be driving. That, that type of technique won't work for every person uh, with memory loss if they don't remember the appointment, for example, um, wherein that news was delivered by the doctor, that's probably not a helpful tool. But for many people, getting a prescription or an order like that can be very helpful. Um, do keep in mind uh, that doctors are human. Right? They, they make mistakes. They sometimes forget to make that report. Um, they sometimes uh, 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 hesitate. They, they don't want to make that report, and so they um, don't go ahead and make the formal diagnosis because they don't want to be the bad guy. Um, we don't advocate for that. We don't want for that to happen, but, you know, again, doctors are human beings with, with um, emotions, and, and these are difficult decisions for them to make as well. So it could very well be sometimes people tell us, we've been to the doctor. We got that diagnosis. We have not heard from the DMV. Um, don't hesitate to check back. Ask the doctor, did they make that report? Or again, see another doctor if you need to. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, I said a moment ago that doctors can't revoke driving privileges, and that is true. Um, so one could have received a word from your doctor. I, I think that I'm making this report to the DMV and I think that you should stop driving. Um, do know that a, a note about that is likely in your medical record. Um, even though you've not lost your driving privileges yet, um, it, it, there is this span of time between when the doctor says that and when the process has happened through the DMV, wherein you lose your driving privileges, um, there is this span of time for many people wherein the doctors told them, I don't think you should be driving, but legally they still can. That's true, they legally can, but in the event that something happened, if you had that accident, if, if you harmed yourself or someone else or their property, um, after a doctor has already told you that they don't think that you should be driving, um, in all likelihood, your insurance provider is not going to cover that incident. So it's a very risky proposition. So I, what I want to say there is that um, while the doctor can't technically take away your driving privileges, um, we should listen to the doctor <laughs> anyway. Um, so what would happen um, after the DMV gets that report um, from the, the Department of Public Health um, that came through the doctor, what might happen? This is, this is where it gets very muddy. Um, the DMV, had, at least in California, um, there is no set protocol for how what's going to happen, um, what, how they're going to test you, whether or not they're even going to retest you. Um, sometimes they will just revoke privileges um, right on the spot based on what they saw in that report from the doctor, um, and sometimes they don't. It's really a very individual decision. Um, and as much as it doesn't always seem like it to the person whose driving privileges are being taken away or being threatened to be taken away, uh, the DMV's perspective is very uh, driver-centric. They want people to retain their driving privileges for as long as possible. So um, sometimes care partners are more um, in tune with, <laughs> with that uh, tendency than people who are living with memory loss or dementia. There's any number of steps that might happen once that report comes in. They may request that the driver come in to take a written test or to take a, a road test um, or both. Um, they don't always ask for a vision test, but they should because of those changes that, um, that Jean was describing. Um, 
there are things that uh, that you can do. Uh, you can request with you can submit something that's called a request for a reevaluation. Um, at the end of the program, Jean's going to walk you through some resources and will tell you how to get your hands on the copy of this form. You don't have to wait for the doctor to make that report. You can do it on your own as well. If you feel that a driver should be reevaluated by the DMV, um, you can uh, submit such a request. Um, so the DMV may uh, be responding to one of those requests. Uh, or they may be responding to a report from a doctor. They may also just be retesting you because it's time, right? But the person who's doing the retesting has an inkling that maybe this person needs to be reevaluated re more carefully. Um, there is something here in San Diego County anyway, I don't know that these exist everywhere, but um, we have the Office of Driver Safety. So most of these um, types of uh, Request or re-examinations or administrative hearings uh, that you you might be able to request if your privileges have been revoked and you want um, to appeal that you want to make a case for why you should get your driving privileges reinstated. For example, most of those types of things happen not at a typical DMV office. Um, good news, you don't have to spend all day there. You can make an appointment at a place called the Office of Driver Safety, um, and it's a much more comfortable, less sort of chaotic environment than the, the DMV. So an administrative hearing may be uh, required as a part of this process. Um, maybe they've received that notice from the physician uh, and you failed your driving test, but they, they have a sense that, you know, maybe you were just having a really bad day um, and they want to sit and talk to you. That's, that's what those administrative hearings are all about. The DMV can also um, simply restrict one's driver's license rather than um, take it, take it, re revoke it altogether. So there may be restrictions put in place like you no know, nighttime driving, um, no freeway driving, no driving, you know, further than a few miles away from home. Um, this isn't always a great idea for a person with dementia, um, but it is something that the DMV um, might do. So again, revocation, the, the suspension or permanent uh, removal of driving privileges can only be done um, by the DMV or law enforcement can do this on the spot. If there's a traffic stop, if there's an incident, um, law enforcement can uh, revoke a person's driving privileges right there um, on the spot. Do be aware that there, yes. There, there's a question that's just come in with regards to revocation. And it is, uh, does the DMV revoke driving privileges for uh, people with Parkinson's disease as well? That's a good question. So um, if you have Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease is not one of the, um, they're called dementing illnesses. Um, that's DMV terminology. Sorry about it. Um, uh, D Parkinson's disease is not considered one of those um, dementing illnesses that is required to be reported, but um, it's very likely that it might be reported. Um, any, any illness that causes dementia, uh, vision impairment, or seizure, uh, seizure or loss of consciousness, um, those are sort of the categories that the doctor has to report. Not every person with Parkinson's disease has dementia. Um, many people do, but certainly not everybody. So I, I can't say a definitive yes or no. I, um, I will look and see if I can uh, find the answer to that question, but um, I would venture to say that no, it is not one of the required diagnoses, um, but a doctor could make that report. Certainly if a person had Parkinson's related dementia, then yes. So um, back to the DMV. Thank you, Jean, for that. Um, back to the DMV, there is uh, an entity called the Senior Ombudsman. Um, this is a person who is devoted to uh, protecting the rights of older drivers, um, being an advocate for them. This, there's just one person who covers um, all of, uh, I think, San Diego and Orange Counties, if I'm not mistaken, so it's a very busy person. <laughs> um, but this is a resource that people have if you want to appeal a decision that the DMV made, for example. Um, this, uh, this person is there to protect those rights. Okay, so it, uh, as Jean was saying um, at, the, at the end of her section there, um, it, it can be difficult to sort of 
determine, you know, who's right here. I think that my person is uh, not safe to drive. They think that they are. How do we make that determination? Um, we never encourage people to, you know, if you're not sure about whether or not someone is safe to drive, don't get behind, don't be a passenger um, and take them on a driving test to find out, right? If you have any inkling that they're not safe to be driving, don't get in the car with them. There are resources out there for requesting uh, a re-evaluation. So uh, again, Jean will walk you through a couple of the local providers of these services, but wherever you are, um, you can contact the rehabilitation department um, of a local hospital. Um, most major hospitals have some type of occupational therapist on staff who specializes in driver safety, um, and many have something that's called a certified driver rehabilitation specialist on staff. So these are uh, professionals who can work within a healthcare system or they can be independent, um, who can uh, safely in a controlled environment uh, evaluate whether or not a person is safe to be driving, whether or not some modifications to their vehicle uh, might be helpful to help them drive safely a little bit longer. Um, if they think that a person is not safe to drive, um, they don't have the ability to uh, revoke driving privileges. It's not like going to the DMV for a road test. Um, but, uh, you know, as, as with the doctor, we certainly recommend that people listen to these recommendations. This can be really helpful um, for families where, or for households where there is conflict, which um, as we'll talk about next, um, there often is when it comes to the topic of driving. It is also an option to, you know, we, the two of us can't agree about whether or not I'm a safe driver. Um, let the DMV uh, make that determination. One can request to be reevaluated um, themselves by the DMV anytime. Very few people do this, <laughs> as you can imagine, because if you don't pass, um, you are losing your driving privileges, but it is an option. The bottom line is that when someone poses a serious risk to themselves, uh, or to other people on the road, and of course cars are very dangerous uh, objects, um, they simply must stop driving. One way or another, um, we have an obligation, we have a duty really to, to them, uh, but to the public um, to, to keep everyone safe and do something. We'll, we'll be talking about uh, how we do that. I think one of the most important things we can do in preparing for a conversation about driving privileges with somebody who's living with memory loss or dementia is to uh, put ourselves in their shoes, to really develop some empathy um, around what it would be like to have to stop driving. And truthfully, uh, most of us, dementia or no dementia, most of us are going to outlive our ability to drive safely. The statistics tell us about 70% of us um, will reach a point in our lives, um, not necessarily related to age, just related to ability or disability, um, wherein uh, we need to stop driving. So all of us would benefit from doing what we can now to prepare to stop driving. Um, this is a good practical step for us all to take in our, in our lives, um, but it also helps us build some empathy for the person who may have to give up driving privileges. So I, I implore all of us right now to start doing some of these things. If you're currently a driver, um, practice being a passenger. This is something um, I really need to work on. I don't like the way my husband drives. Uh, I just don't. Um, and I like to give him lots of corrective advice um, when I am a passenger. And something I can really work on is practice being a quieter <laughs> A quieter passenger, right? Get used to other people driving me around because if the time comes, you know, today I can just, if I don't, if we're going somewhere, I'm going to drive because I'd rather do that. But um, learning to be a passenger in somebody else's vehicle, um, whether it's going to be a spouse, um, one of your adult children, or a professional, right? It might be a, a professional in home caregiver that's going to be driving you around. Uh, it's really good to get into the practice of kind of zipping it um, when, when it's uh, not a critical situation, of course. Um, restricting one's own driving. Jean gave a good example of what she's doing in her own life, right? Just so and I'm starting to do this as well. Just recognizing I don't feel as comfortable uh, late at night. I don't feel as comfortable at dusk, you know, um, related to eye strain, eye fatigue. Um, so I'm learning to restrict 
where and when I drive, reducing the need to drive, right? Combining trips, um, learning to uh, be better about carpooling. I can't do a lot of that right now, but um, in, in normal life, right, we can build in so sources of social support, right? Why don't you drive this week and I'll drive next week to this thing that we both go to on a regular basis rather than both of us taking our cars separately. There is something that you can do that's called a driving agreement or a family contract. Um, they're very rarely used, but um, it's a really nice tool. You can download, you can Google it and find them online. Um, an agreement that says, okay, I agree when the time comes um, that, you know, you, my children or my spouse or my neighbor or whoever it is, when the time comes that you think that I'm no longer safe to drive, I hereby agree um, to stop driving. It's not a legally binding contract, but it can be a very helpful tool uh, for that care partner, or that member of the support system to be able to come back to. This is also a nice interim step that you can take um, early on in your conversations about, you know, I'm becoming worried about your driving. If the person doesn't currently feel ready to give up the keys or, you know, it's, it's baby steps, you're not there just yet, um, you might initiate um, the, the formation of some kind of a written agreement. Okay, now's not the time, but let's agree, right, that in six months I'll be retested or, you know, some, some such agreement. Again, there's nothing legally binding about this, but it can be very helpful um, mentally for everybody in this, in this discussion. Start thinking about transportation alternatives. We'll be talking about that um, quite a bit here in a moment. Um, exploring those options for either professional transportation services or making arrangements with members of your natural um, support system. Uh, so this is all about de developing a personal transportation plan. If I had to stop driving today, what would I do? Um, what are my resources? Who are my people? Who are my supports? Um, how, am I close to public transportation? Do I know how to use it? Um, am I certified for paratransit, which is for people with disabilities? Um, developing your personal transportation plan allows you to already have those alternatives um, and backups in place. So um, an important part of the, the empathy building um, part of the, the, the preparation for having these discussions around um, driving. Give some thought to this question. You don't have to say it out loud or, or chat it to us, you can just think it, um, but reflect on what driving means to you uh, if you currently are a driver. Just spend a moment. Some of the things that we tend to hear from people when we ask this question, it means independence. It signaled my adulthood, right? It was the thing that separated me from my younger siblings when I was a kid, for example. The big part of my identity. It gives me a sense of freedom, autonomy, right? Um, access. It's, it's the way that I get where to the places and people and things um, that are important to me. So, Spend some time thinking about this for yourself and spend some time also in reflection about what you think um, the person who, that if you need to have a conversation with somebody about their driving, um, come to the conversation having thought this through a little bit. What does driving mean to them? Uh, what potentially does giving up driving mean to them? Ability, another one there. Think about what fears you might have if, you know, heaven forbid, right now you had to stop driving, you weren't going to drive ever again, what would you be afraid of, right? Feeling fearful about that um, is a major reason that a lot of people won't even go to get a memory screening or getting a diagnosis, they won't talk to the doctor about it, and they absolutely will not engage in conversations with their um, support system about their driving. Um, the, the prospect of not being able to drive is just too scary. Right? So the things that um, people tell us, um, they don't want to be um, dependent on other people, they don't want to be a burden, um, changing responsibilities. If I'm the care partner here and I insist that my husband stop driving because I think it's not safe, what does that mean in my life? 
right? That means probably I'm going to become the primary driver in our household. So people's roles and responsibilities within a household or within their social groups um, can change significantly when they stop driving. And this affects us deeply. We feel grief around that. A very legitimate concern, um, something we absolutely have to address in advance of taking away car keys or taking any of these interventions um, is the, the prospect of social isolation, especially in a place like San Diego County that is very spread out, very large. For many of us, the people we spend time with, the things we do, the places that make us feel whole, um, and active and full of purpose, they're not right around the corner from us. We can't walk there. Um, so uh, the, the fear of being isolated from the people and places and things that are important to us um, is a very significant need, a fear that we, um, we should address. People get, well, am I going to be able to get to the gym, right? The places, I, the beach I like to go walk to, um, the beach I like to walk at, I can't necessarily, it's not right outside my door, I have to drive there, right? So having that um, decreased activity, um, and this is a very, a very important one, this loss of privacy. This is something that um, Jean and I, for many years, co-facilitated a support group for people who had an, uh, a mild diagnosis of Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia. Driving was a huge topic of conversation, as you can imagine. Um, and this loss of privacy was one aspect of that I honestly had never considered um, until I was really hearing people with dementia talk about it directly. Right? If I, for example, on my way home from work, um, I just feel I, I'm, I want to eat ice cream for dinner. A, a pint of ice cream sounds like a perfectly legitimate and delightful dinner for me today. Um, if I want to do that, I'll just stop, pick up some ice cream and eat it before I get home and no one is the wiser, right? I don't have to justify that to anybody. I don't have to explain it. Um, whereas if I am a person who depends on other people for transportation, and I ask you to take me to the drugstore, right? What are you likely to say? In all likelihood, you're going to say, sure, what do you need, right? It's, it's what we do. We're not trying to pry, but it's what we do. You need my help? Sure, why do you need my help, right? So people will, I, I need to pick up some medicine for my foot fungus, right? Like whatever that thing might be, um, I now have to tell you everything um, that, that I need. That loss of privacy is very significant um, and something we really ought to be thinking about and preparing for um, in advance um, when, before we get ready to have this conversation with someone. All boils down to that um, wanting autonomy and not having as much control over our lives. Um, that is real. We all have a need for autonomy um, in our lives. We can't necessarily stay independent um, as we age or as we become disabled uh, over time, um, but we can do some things to help ourselves um, feel uh, a little bit more in control. So in planning for having these conversations and what might be ahead and giving up uh, driving privileges, think about these things. What does driving mean to this person or to me, if I'm the person who's contemplating not driving anymore? What are my fears? Which of those fears are realistic and which are some things we could do some things now um, to, to address? Right. It, as a care partner, keep a detailed written record of your concerns and your observations so that when you're broaching this difficult conversation, you, you're not saying something like, well, you know, I've just seen over time, I, I'm starting to worry more about your driving. I just don't think it's safe. Right? You want to have some concrete sense of what you have observed, when it happened, what the circumstances were. You're not necessarily sharing all of these details with the person, right? You're not um, presenting um, a court case to them, but this will really help you come to the conversation more confident, right? That you, you know, you can give some concrete examples of what you have observed or what other people um, have observed. It's be very helpful to just talk to other people that know this person, um, collect some anecdotes or observations. Um, again, not to throw it in their face, not to um, uh, make a full accounting of everything that they've done wrong, but so that you're coming to the conversation confidently. 
we don't want to, Jean alluded to this earlier, we don't want to broach the subject of giving up the car keys, not driving anymore, or just let me do more of the driving these days, for example. Um, we don't want to do that without presenting an alternative, right? Coming to the conversation that's all about just taking away the keys, the car, the driving privileges. Um, we also have to be prepared to give the person a substitute. Right? I'm concerned about your driving. I really think given the changes that you've been experiencing long term, um, I, I need we need to talk now about a time that you're not going to be able to drive. And I've done some research, right? I have found a local volunteer um, uh, driving organization that we can sign up with uh, and here's what they can do, right? Knowing um, in advance, coming to the conversation, having prepared for, um, I heard about this great service that um, that uh, JFS offers, right? Um, for example, or Go Go Grandparent, this wonderful app. Um, for um, older people that, that we can use um, to, to order uh, car service, for example. Right? Coming to the conversation, having thought through, here's what we're going to do instead, um, will help you to be a lot more successful. And finally, you don't have to be on this journey by yourself. Get some support. Right. Talk to us at Alzheimer's San Diego. Our social workers um, can meet with you, can talk with you to help you plan through this conversation. Um, professional care managers, case managers, fiduciaries, um, for example, these, fo these folks can all be sources of support to you, um, either one on one in the conversation itself or just as you are preparing to have it. Above all else, again, I, I just want to. Um, it's sort of like me giving you permission, right? You are probably going to hurt someone's feelings. You are probably going to make somebody angry, right? Um, but that person's safety and the public's safety, um, to put it a little bit harshly, is more important than anyone's feelings, right? Um, so sometimes people just need to hear that. <laughs> it is okay to sort of kick that hornet's nest. And, and yes, you're going to stir up um, lots of drama, lots of anger, um, but I can honestly say in, in 20 years now of supporting families through these conversations and through these transitions, um, yes, many people get upset about this. Um, many people, um, you know, refuse to talk to their kids uh, for a while because they're very angry about this. Um, I've never known a family that was permanently rent um, by one of these, um, one of these discussions. Um, emotions will, uh, will dissipate right? Rips and tears in a relationship will heal. Um, the, safe, the safety of that person um, is, is simply more important right, than protecting their feelings or, or protecting yourself uh, from the conflict or the difficulty around those feelings. So sometimes uh, all of our planning and conversation is just not going to be enough. We sometimes have to step in and take some kind of action. This is unpleasant, um, but it is something that we need to do uh, from time to time. So hopefully we're helping you feel more prepared for these more sort of passive ways that you can get the person, you know, living with dementia to be involved um, in the discussion. Um, but that is not always possible. We do know that. So you can request that re-examination uh, from the DMV and you can do it multiple times. You can ask other people to submit, um, to submit these requests. They don't always act on them, but generally, um, as, as with any um, type of government entity, if they, you, know, you create enough of a paper trail, um, they hear from you enough times, um, you can uh, get their attention. So you can request a re-examination. Um, you can simply make the, the car or the car keys not accessible to the person, right? If the person has significant memory loss, disorientation, confusion, sometimes just removing uh, the keys, the car, all those signs, all those, those sort of cues, um, don't leave the car sitting in the driveway, right? Park it around the corner where the person doesn't see it. Um, many times just simply the out of sight, out of mind um, technique will work pretty well. Um, you can, if you can't fully remove the car, maybe you can disable it, right, so that um, the key won't start it, uh, the battery is disconnected, right, um, sometimes these things are possible. Um, it's, uh, it's extreme, and we, we, of course, want to address these issues before it gets there, but it's also um, a possibility, uh, a need sometimes to just contact law enforcement. 
and say, right, my, my person, I'm very concerned about, in the same way that we might do if somebody were driving under the influence, right, um, of a substance. Um, my, uh, someone that I know just left in the car, here's the, the car, the license plate, here's what they were wearing, here's where I think they were going, um, and I don't think that they're safe. Right. We can uh, use law enforcement in this way too. Um, it is it is extreme. It's dramatic and and painful and difficult. But it is it is always a possibility. Underlying all of this, again, um, to reinforce, it is important that we before we take any action, we have put some alternatives in place so that we are not leaving the person stranded, socially isolated, unable to do the things they want and need to do. We'll stop here and pause and see if any questions have come in. There is a question, Amy. Mm -hmm. I see that. Um, as someone who has an acquired brain injury, is there any type of cognitive retraining for someone the very first onset of a memory loss diagnosis? This is a really interesting question. Yes, um, acquired brain injury is a bit different from a progressive form of dementia. Right. Um, so, yes, those uh, Jean's going to be talking um, now about resources for different things, including reevaluation. Um, and you can actually work with an occupational therapist um, or a driver like a, they have like driver retraining programs, um, certainly that that can be helpful. This is um, this is one of the 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 sort of difficult gray areas when it comes to driving and we call this class driving and memory loss, right? There's different types of memory loss. Some types of memory loss are not necessarily progressive, right? They come from um, a traumatic brain injury, an acquired brain injury, a stroke. Um, they aren't actually expected to get worse over time. Either they'll stay steady um, or they might even improve. The person might be able to rehabilitate. That's why those driver retraining programs exist. Um, in a person with dementia, as Jean mentioned at the beginning, these are progressive conditions. We don't have treatment and cure for them. We, are, we have to, unfortunately, at this time, plan ahead for those symptoms to get worse. And so typically, um, driver retraining or rehabilitation services are not available to people who have dementia. But other types of uh, brain impairment that cause memory loss, yes, it's a great question. Uh, ooh, a really good question here. Um, with COVID-19, is the DMV currently backed up um, and not able to respond? That's a really good question. I do not know. Um, I haven't actually walked anybody through this process um, lately. I mean, in the last two months since, since um, everything has been shut down. Um, my guess would be yes. Uh, I, uh, Jean, do you have any insight into this? I, I don't, but I just think common sense would probably tell us yes. I mean, you think about last time I was in the DMV, how crowded and busy and chaotic it was. Um, yeah. I, right. So much can be done online now. I think like, like all of us, they're probably trying to figure out um, how to do more of their services online. Certainly right now, there's, there's no reason you could not um, request a reevaluation for somebody uh, now, because it's just a, a form that you download and submit online. Mm -hmm. Um would it take them longer to respond to it at this point? I would certainly think so. Yeah. Yeah, I really think that's the, the safe assumption here. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over. Okay. So. Oh, boy. <laughs> I've got to work on that. I know. <laughs> So consider alternatives. And, you know, let me just start by saying, you know, we're pretty lucky here in San Diego County, uh, folks. We really have a lot of good transportation options that are out there. And so we'll go through these things fairly quickly. We do, uh, in future slides, include some URLs and websites so you can go and check it out more carefully. So we've got the demand responsive services. Yes, taxis still exist. And uh, they're out there, you see them once in a while. Um, you still can phone Yellow Cab and, and get a taxi to take you wherever you want to go. Of course, we've got Uber and Lyft. I think most of us are familiar with that. And in another slide or two, I'll make some specific references to a program through Jewish Family Services using Uber and Lyft. 
There is Go Go Grandparent, um, and this is a, a specific program as well where seniors can use, actually, I guess I'm just talking about it right now, this is through Jewish Family Services. Seniors can use a landline to request a door-to-door -door ride, and family members can monitor to make sure there is, you know, just as a safety measure to make sure their mom or dad or their person with dementia has been picked up and has got to the place they need to go to and, and everything has gone safely. Um, here in San Diego, we have uh, actually a really good paratransit uh, program and it is low cost. Riders do need to be certified, you know, as having a disability, but uh, it's, it's really a good program here and used by many folks. Uh, we have lots of nonprofit and volunteer programs as well, and I'll talk about a website here shortly that can show you all those different options that are out there, nonprofit and volunteer. There are some transportation services that are activity or location specific to different cities here in San Diego and also uh, sometimes specific to an activity such as, you know, and sometimes to a disease, you know, uh, so um, not always just dementia, but also, you know, uh, say, for example, breast cancer uh, patients who are needing transportation for chemotherapy. So um, there's lots of those out there, and you can have a look at those through the website I'm going to tell you about. There are private transportation services of different kinds, fee-based, everything from a car service, you know, a limo, kind of a limo service. I'm not saying necessarily a limousine as in the vehicle but a car service with a, with a driver who will take you where you want to go, all the way to uh, the non-emergency medical transports that you can hire that is a private transportation service. And of course, there's friends, family, and other natural supports that we have out there. A uh, good time to be good friends with your neighbors or be a good neighbor. Um, you know, maybe you can hitch a ride with your neighbor uh, you know, using social distancing, I don't know, maybe you ride in the back and you're, you're wearing your mask and you both go to the grocery store, you get your stuff and your neighbor gets theirs. This is really driving me a little bit crazy, all this back and forth stuff. All right, so let's talk about these resources. So for looking at uh, the Metropolitan Transit Systems, MTS, which in uh, the part that is the paratransit uh, system, go to this particular website and it is low cost. It's a one way is $5. It's recently, well, last, late last year, went up a little bit. $5 for one way and it is curb to curb and of course they're wheelchair equipped. You do have to reserve in advance. And by the way, and I should say this about many of these driving resources, some of them have changed and or been impacted by sheltering in place and the pandemic. Um, so it's a good idea to contact any of them uh, beforehand, not only to reserve a ride, but to find out, you know, if it's volunteer based, are they still offering it at this time or not? And what are the rules and regulations? Obviously, you will be wearing masks, uh, but it's a good idea to contact these folks. Here's one of the websites that I think is really super fantabulous, and it's this Facilitating Access to Transportation, factsd.org. And what you do when you go to this website is you just put in your zip code pickup and the zip code drop off location and it will come up with a list of all the different options that are out there that can provide transportation from those zips, zip code to the one you put in. And you'll scroll through them to see what all is out there and what works for you and what you uh, qualify for. Uh, again, because it includes programs that are volunteer based for specific people for specific things. Uh, so it's very good and very comprehensive. Ride Fact, so this is a part of the factsd.org uh, 
um, website serves all the cities in San Diego County and includes a couple of others. And when you look through this, you'll see that reservations can be made and costs are again quite affordable, um, starting from $2.50 for a ride from zero to five miles and then going up in increments from there, but it's very you know, affordable. And um, then we have Jewish Family Services. They have several different transportation programs available for folks. Have a look at their website. Um, they've got um, Rides and Smiles, which is uh, kind of a step up type of program for people um, where it's more than just curb to curb. They can get a little bit more specialized services. They have Navigator. This is a program that does connect riders to the ride sharing uh, options like Lyft and Uber, and it can again be monitored to ensure safety. So some good programs there through Jewish Family Service. Jean, if I could just provide a, a point of clarification. Um, a question came in about Go Go Grandparent. I just wanted, before I lost sight of it, um, it is actually not an app. Um, it, the thing that's cool about Go Go Grandparent is you don't have to use a cell phone um, you know, or a smartphone to use it. It's designed for people that don't use apps. Um, so uh, just on their website, which is gogograndparent.com, um, uh, there's just a phone number. You sign up for the service in advance, and then the person just makes a call um, for service. You can, uh, you as the care partner can sign up to get text message updates, you know, that they're, they were picked up, they were um, dropped off at their particular spot. Um, you can use your smartphone for it, um, but uh, the, 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 the person with the disability who calls for the ride can just do it using a regular telephone. So. Yes, a landline, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. So here's our evaluation resources that Amy was talking about, and I'll just mention a couple of things about each of them. This uh, American Occupational Therapy Association is really excellent. So what you do, again, when you go to this website, you enter your own zip code and it will pull up a list of uh, the occupational therapists who are um, specialists in senior driving evaluation. And um, you can have a look at what, you know, what it is they do. Uh, it gives you specific information about each of these OTs. And um, they can do both driving evaluations as well as training in, in the vehicle. And by training, that can mean everything from um, seeing how a person is positioned in a vehicle. Maybe you need to have your seat um, up a little bit more and back a little bit more or adjusting mirrors and, and headrests and this kind of thing. So it's a, it's a terrific resource for folks to have a little check on, on driving. Um, there's local driving evaluation programs through the Scripps Driving Program. This is up in Encinitas at Scripps Memorial. And there's also one through Sharp Adapt adapted driving program. And I think both of these programs have um, driver simulations that they use to, as a part of their evaluation for driving skill. Um, Scripps does, I believe. Isn't that true, Amy? I think, I think so. I think so. Um, and then there's Tri-City Medical Center driver retraining program also. And their program is called the Good to Go program. So these are all programs that do this driver evaluation. And um, again, you know, you can go through the evaluations and these folks are not reporting to DMV. So, um, you know, it gives you an idea of what's going on and uh, also then what steps to be taking accordingly. If I could just add a note on insurance coverage, a lot of time people have questions about that. Medicare will cover um, a driver re, uh, Reevaluation, excuse me, a driver evaluation um, through a rehabilitation program if you have a condition um, that is rehabilitatable. So um, yeah. if you have had a stroke, if you have an acquired brain injury, um, uh, often Medicare or tra traditional health insurance will cover this. Um, in the case of dementia, um, usually we find people do have to pay out of pocket 
for right. these private pay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, driver safety information. There was a question earlier about uh, where do I get the request for driver re-examination. Go to the DMV website. It's form 699 and you can just download it and um, it will direct you as to what the procedures are. And this is also where you can find about the Senior Driving Resources and Ombudsman Program. Amy mentioned there's one driver om ombudsman here in San Diego, Orange County area. I think that's right. There's only four throughout the state of California. So these folks are busy, but I'll tell you, I have, it's been a long time. It wouldn't be one of the current ombudsmans, but in the past I have met and heard present an ombudsman from this program. And these folks are really dedicated and committed to their positions to ensure that seniors, you know, are treated fairly with this whole, um, you know, do your driving privileges get revoked or not? They, they don't, they are neutral in that they are there to ensure and protect um, public safety and adhere to the laws, but they are also really good advocates for uh, safe senior driving as well too. So uh, consider that a good program and a good resource for you. The Insurance Institute for Highway Safe. The Older Driver Information Center has just got loads and loads of facts and figures. If you're somebody who likes statistics, you can have a look in there and, and see what the latest statistics are telling us about older drivers. And you can do the same at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. They also have some really great tips on talking with the person who's driving and or assessing driving skill in yourself or in others. Um, the AARP driver safety programs, again, has just lots of good information and tips. AAA, American Automobile Association, driver education senior programs, more tips, more resources, and um, just lots of good information there. For advocacy and information, Free Wheeling After 60 is kind of a cool website. And this is a, a business, and the lady who um, started this program, what she is doing is really, it's like concierge transportation planning um, for individuals and for families, so that, you know, this would be a, a resource to go to to have this particular company help you to develop your transportation plan based on what is going on in your life, where you live, what your options are. And yeah, that can be a great resource because you know it, this takes time and effort, transportation planning. And so um, this lady is really connected with all these resources and she can, she can work with you to develop your own personal plan. The Hartford Center for Mature Market Excellence is another good website to go to. They've got all sorts of different guides. On They have a, a good guide on, a couple actually of good guides on driving. One is Your Road Ahead. It's kind of your own personal look at driving skills. And then another one that's called At the Crossroads, which is intended for family and caregivers. And it gives you lots of good tips and ideas and again, kind of opening the conversation, how to talk about this important topic of driving. Um, Those are and, free downloadable yes, um, free little downloadable. booklets. Yeah. And mm -hmm. or you can um, just order one and, and they'll send it out to you at no cost. And, um, you know, they've got also guides just on other things as well too, like disaster planning. So it's just a good resource. The National Aging and Disability Transportation Center, again, another good resource with just good information and what they call um, travel training, which I like the idea of that. Mm -hmm. It's like training, you know, we need to do some training for ourselves when we're, we're talking about this and for our people living with dementia um, to start getting used to some of the new transportation options we may be using. So, um, and don't hesitate to lean on us uh, at yeah. all time in San Diego. We I, 
our resource to you as well. Yeah, uh, Amy, I'll let you talk about um, this, but I do just want to say, you know, about our programs and services, but I do just want to say all these different resources will um, be in the slide deck that we do send out to you folks. And additionally, if you want more resources regarding transportation, give us a call at the number that we have listed in all our information, 858-492-4400 and ask for the tip sheets on driver safety, driving safety, transportation resources, any, anything related to that. And we've got some additional materials that we can email out to you or mail out to you. Yeah, we, we won't send a, a barrage of information out to you after the webinar, but know that many um, driving uh, and driving safety specific tip sheets are available. So um, our, the, our social work services, um, that that's the way to request that. Just give us a call, send us an email, um, or drop us a, a, a live chat from our website, and we'll be happy to get, get those materials to you. Um, so uh, hopefully you're familiar with us at Alzheimer's San Diego, but if you're not, here's a quick look at um, the range of uh, free support and service uh, that's available through our organization. All of these services are being provided remotely, of course, right now, um, online uh, or by phone, depending on the service. So um, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, get in touch with our social workers for more information or some do, for doing some of that research on local transportation options. Um, keep coming to classes. We have new programs um, every week and all of our um, uh, previously offered programs are recorded and available on, in our webinar library on our website. Um, we have 21 uh, support groups now meeting virtually online using uh, Zoom, private Zoom links. Um, so if you are not already connected to a support group, um, this is a wonderful resource for getting support around the very difficult, tricky topic of either giving up driving or having to um, help somebody else give it up. Um, we have an amazing virtual companion program. Uh, our ALS companion program is uh, a respite program for dementia caregivers. Uh, we now have volunteers meeting with uh, our families virtually making uh, virtual visits. So um, that is available to anybody as well as um, our uh, social activities. We have our movement and motion program online now. Um, all of this information is, is, of course, on our website. If you are in need of some uh, cloth facial coverings, we have an incredible core of volunteers sewing for us. Um, we can get you a few. Just give us a call, let us know, um, and we'll mail them out. Um, you all met Sierra at the beginning of this program. She is a member of our volunteer tech team. Uh, if you need help with any of this technology, not just for classes, but um, you want to start doing some family video conference calls um, on your own and you don't really know how to do the technology, let us know. Our volunteers can help you with that. Um, so Alzheimer's San Diego is a local nonprofit organization. If you um, don't know us already, please visit our website, um, get to know more about us. Um, we are um, independent. We only serve San Diego County. We're not part of any national network um, of organizations. So everything we do is um, made possible by support from our community. We're very grateful for that. So you can reach us through our website. Um, you can call that main number, send us an email, or um, drop our team a message using the live chat function um, on our website. So I'm going to send out now in the chat, and you will also get a little reminder when the webinar ends, um, a, a link to a short survey. Uh, we would love to get your feedback. Uh, let's see if it's going to go. Did it go? We'd love to get your feedback. Um, on this program, my apologies. There we go. Um, again, you'll you'll get a link to that sent out to you when you uh, exit the webinar today. Um, it, additionally, we will send an email out with the program materials as Jean indicated. So weekly programs continue um, online using a Zoom webinar. The next one will be 
Thursday, June 4th, um, a program on managing resistance specifically for um, care partners. Uh, and then on June 10th, um, a, a discussion about uh, after the move to memory care, the, the different types of challenges that people experience when their loved one has moved into a residential care environment. So information about all of those classes as well as all of those programs that we mentioned earlier um, are all available on our website. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you for your good questions and your participation in the program here today. It was, um, it was fun for us uh, having you uh, with us. We're sorry we can't see you, but it's nice to have you. And uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap things up. Anything else, Jean? No, think so. If you've got any questions, we'll stick around for a few minutes here so that um, you can send those questions to us. And otherwise, if you think of something, a question you should have asked uh, this afternoon, give us a call at our office and we'll be happy to continue the dialogue with you. Thank you everybody for joining us here today. It's always good to see you. <laughs> That's right. Thank you.